Uh, I hate to tell you, it's just over 40 years now that I've been working for Bristol Water. Yeah, it started in 1968, so uh, a long time. <laughs> and how long has the fishery itself been going? Well, Chew Valley's been here since 1956. Uh, it was opened by the Queen to supply water to Bristol, uh, so it's just over 50 years now, just celebrated our 50 years a couple of years ago. And so it was made specifically to supply water to the Bristol area? Yeah, it was planned before the Second World War, but it was all shelled because of the um, hostilities at the time, and uh, yeah, carried on building after the war and opened in '56, and been going strong ever since. Now I gather that there was a village out there. Well, not really. Everybody comes along thinking there was a village with a church and uh, when it's rough you can hear the bells ringing and all the other stories that we've heard. But no, there was a very small hamlet in Morton of about six cottages that were completely demolished. There were also about six or eight houses and mills that again were completely demolished. So there is nothing out there under the surface at all except stones and the odd bridge. And the odd bridge, <laughs> right. Oh, I was going to say, because I'd heard that story about the bell. Oh, everybody uh, has. <laughs> on windy days you can hear the bell ringing under the water. Well, the average depth of the lake is only 14 feet and the maximum is 37 so any houses or anything else that would have been built would obviously still be sticking out of the top of the water and a church steeple would make a fine area to go and fish around I'm sure but a bit of a hazard to shipping I think. Yeah nice to have a future <laughs> wouldn't it. So the, the history of Bristol Water I mean they used to breed your own fish at Ubley, is it? We still do. We still rear quite a few of our own fish. Uh, mostly we buy in now small fish, uh, five gram fish, which are literally just hatched and uh, got rid of the yolk sac, and we rear them onto two, year, two years old. But we still do breed some of our own browns, and we still do breed some of our own rainbows, um, all still at Ubley Hatchery. Uh, once we grow them on to two years old, they're spread out around the various hatchery sites and uh, fish farm, and then put in the lake when they're two years old or 18 months old. So what sort of size would they be? When they... Well, it depends a little bit on how old they are and which lakes we're putting them in, but the average as they go in usually is about 2, 2, 2, 4, a little bit smaller up at the Barrows. Um, we rear about 100,000 fish a year, so... 100,000? Still, still a big business, yeah. Very much yeah. so, yeah, definitely. So, you're rearing 100,000 fish, now you've got a massive lake here to chew. <laughs> Correct. Now, obviously, you don't <laughs> put them all in in one lump. No. We've got 1,200 acres here, we've got 440 acres at Blagdon, plus our other little fisheries as well around about. So what we do is an initial planting, usually uh, between the lakes of about 40,000. The other 60,000 are planted every fortnight or so throughout the year. A couple of thousand into here, 1,200, 1,500 into Barrows or uh, Blagdon or a few into Barrows. It depends on how each lake is fishing as to how many we put in. But it ends up that we usually have about 50 odd thousand fish going to here, about 35,000 going to Bar uh, Blagdon and then the rest of them between Lytton and Barrows. So they all get a very good spread. Uh, it makes for a good fishing on all the lakes all the way through. Very average fishing all the time. So, with that many, I've been asked this, when I take people out, they go, how many fish are here? How many fish in the, every acre of this lake? Uh, well, if you took every acre, probably not very many. It's a 1,200-acre lake, so if you spread 24,000 fish between 12, 1,200 acres, you're only talking about 20 fish an acre. 20 fish. Uh, but it's actually more than that, uh, probably more than that. You've got to take in the residual from last year, uh, fish which aren't caught, cool, but then you've also got to take into account predation, poaching, fish which die obviously through natural mortality, awful lot of fish that don't get put on our return cards. It's very difficult to know but we aim for about 20 fish per acre out here, a few more on Blagdon, more again on the Barrows, the smaller the fishery the more fish per acre. So uh, yeah 20 fish per acre but in actual fact probably a lot of the acres have got very few fish, especially the very shallow areas or where it gets very weedy, a lot of the acres have got a lot more fish. Right, that's fine. That's what I want to know, so I can speak with authority next Hopefully, time. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> so you mentioned about how wonderful the fishing is here very often. Uh -huh. I, I think today any fish that uh, are around might need ray bands. Yeah, it's going to be a bit harder today, but you'd be surprised. Even on this lake on a day like today, you'll still find a few fish moving sometime or other. Um, probably later today rather than middle of the day. But it won't stop the fish feeding. It's still fairly early season. The fish are feeding very heavily, so they'll probably go down a little bit today. You may have to get a wee bit deeper to find them but um, you'll find fish somewhere today. So you've got uh, a full package then that you can offer anybody that comes here really? Pretty much yeah, I mean we literally go from the complete beginners all the way through to real experts. We have um, international here this year on Chew which is great, we've had the world championships in the past. There's something for everybody here and it really is 
a, a pretty much complete fishery and you can try virtually any method you like and you will usually catch fish on almost any method out here it is a wonderful fishery and so you do allow for the beginners then like have you have tuition days we do we have tuition days we have beginners and um, uh, fishing lessons we do all sorts of things to try and help everybody we have uh, experts like yourself who actually come out and take people out as well so if they want private tuition they can come along and uh, yeah we um, we introduce a lot of people to fly fishing uh, and although it is tough out here once you become a fairly competent fisherman on Chew Valley or Blagden you're pretty competent anywhere in the world um, it's a very very good fishery to teach people to fish on and if you can learn properly you'll go anywhere you want and catch fish oh that's nice to hear and of course the facilities you've got your new lodge mm -hmm. behind you with a bar <laughs> a bar and dining. restaurant yes everything in there fishermen don't use it that much to be honest they come in for a point sometimes in the evening and we do use it after some of the major competitions but it's mostly open for the general public these days so that they can come and enjoy the same facilities that we've been fortunate to enjoy for many many years and it's a very very popular place for people to come uh, saying that we've got Blagden just down the road which I think is where you're going today very oldy worldy still very much of the old type fisheries and I think an awful lot of fishermen still prefer that sort of thing to be honest. Oh yeah I'm sure when we get over there we'll be having a look at the old lodge you building will. which mm -hmm. is so attractive. Yeah correct. Thanks very much for your time Bob. I think no that problem. Do it. You've given me some information about the prospects already as in find some deeper water maybe. Yeah definitely. Stick uh, some buzzers on, stick some deal backs on, get it down and fish it slow. I would be surprised if you don't catch and if all else fails put something orange and fluffy on, give it a pull. <laughs> All right, I can be a yob with a blob if I have to. Correct. <laughs> Thanks very much, Bob. No trouble, mate. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Here I am at Blagdon Reservoir. This is one of my favourite pieces of water. It belongs to Bristol Waterworks. It's a massive expanse of water, some 440 acres. From the top end, where it's quite shallow, right the way down to the dam, where we've got a good depth of water. Now to cover that water, what I'm going to do today is boat fish. It's a beautiful way to spend a day. You get to cover the whole reservoir. We can look for moving fish. We can try the shallows, the middle, the deeps, the whole lot. So the sooner I get out there, the better. So I'm going to go and get my boat. When I arrived here this morning, it was absolutely flat calm. Looking out there now, there is a slight ripple. Still bright sunshine, so we can't be guaranteed the fish moving on the surface, but the ripple certainly will improve our chances of catching. The water clarity here at the moment is fantastic. Almost too fantastic. To such an extent, I've set up with a very long leader so that I don't spook the fish. There's about 18 foot of leader there. This is my boat, number 17. I'm going to start loading up and get out there and try and get amongst them. Always got to be careful getting in a boat. Make sure that all your pockets are zipped up. That one wasn't. Otherwise, your flies could end up falling in for you. You'll also notice that I've got... Um, I'm not wearing a life jacket. Actually, I am. This waistcoat is a life jacket as well. And it's compulsory on Bristol Water that you wear your life jacket at all times when in a boat, health and safety. Got to take it seriously. I intend getting comfortable, so on goes the seat. And Blagdon is down in a valley. Because of that, the sound travels up through the valley at edge. Now, you've got your oars, you can row, or you can do what I do. I've already ferried down an amount of equipment couple of batteries and an electric outboard so this is going to go on and providing we don't have to travel too far and make the batteries go flat in which case we've always got the oars we should be able to cover a lot of water I like to be comfortable when we're fishing this is a fairly new boat seat and it is a little bit more complicated than putting up your average deck chair but it's going to be well worth it when it's set up. Let's loosen off all the securing catches. Where's my other one? There. Watch your fingers when you do this. That's it, we swing this out. This will allow me to sit across the boat so that I'm actually facing the way that I'm fishing. 
there. And if I want a lazy moment, there. I can sit comfortably across the boat and fish. And let's get my battery. Batteries. It's surprising the amount of equipment you take when you're boat fishing. I feel like a course fisherman at times. I should be glad to get in there and sit down. I've got four rods with me. Only one of them set up so far. But I want to be ready if I have to go on the dries on the surface. If I need to get down to an intermediate. If the fish go down because of the bright sunlight, I'll have to follow them down. So I've got one for an intermediate, one for dries, and a spare. Yeah, well, I've certainly had some exercise there. Oh, get my breath back. Just going to connect the batteries now, get started, get out there. While we were setting up, and I was by the lodge, looking out over the water, there was some fish moving fairly close in, right in front of the lodge. Only about 35 yards out, so whilst I can't see them moving again now, I'm hopeful they'll still be in the same area. So I'm just going to have a fast drift across them. We say, say a fast drift. It won't be that fast because there isn't much ripple, but certainly I will not need to use a drogue. I will just let the breeze take me as it wants to. This particular area where the fish are, or were, is a very shallow shelf and it's weedy. At this time of year we're okay, we have a few feet of water, but you can see the reeds just breaking the surface there, the, the plants. You can see a dark patch out there, which is probably a weed bed, so I'm gonna aim just to try and miss that. And I'm gonna head in on an angle over there. I've set up a three-team leader. On the point, I've got a black buzzer. I've got a dropper about four foot above it with a red rib dial back. And I've also got a red rib dial back on the top. And I say this leader is a long one. Because the water is so clear, I don't want to risk lining the fish if I can help it. So I'll just pop some line up to get me started and then cast to them. First cast of the day, here we go. And those fish are definitely not showing here now. But they could still be in the area, just down a bit lower. There. I can see every detail on the bottom. We've had a lot of high pressure recently, which means calm conditions. Consequently, the silt hasn't been blown up in the water, and it's had a chance to clear out. And the visibility because of that is exceptional, absolutely exceptional. The only uh, thing making a ripple on the water now are the coots, not the trout as they were. Although, after saying that, there was a fish. He will be moving slightly upwind. Got to give it a few seconds for the flies to get down to where he was, by which time he could well have moved on. Little steady figure of eight retrieve. And a slow lift off. No, we missed out on that one. So the fish will be moving upwind. The wind is on my back, I'm moving downwind. The fish are coming upwind. 
So that way I'm covering a lot more fish. And out. No joy from that one. I'm going to move me. I'm going to just gently put it in reverse and take us in a little bit. Let's just get my flies out of the water, otherwise I could be accused of trolling, something you're not allowed to do. That is to say, have your flies in the water with the boat moving in any direction and just dragging the flies behind the boat. Just not done. It means that guys don't have to cast. It's normally done with a sinking line. I put a sinking line with a lure on the back of the boat and just with the motor, just move along. Unfortunately, you know, that means they cover a lot of water but there's no skill involved in it, even though it does catch a lot of fish. Not sporting, not allowed, we don't do it. Surprising with all this bright sunshine that they're actually rising. Not gonna put out too long a line. You don't need to from a boat. Let's face it, where were the fish? That last fish that moved was only 10 yards away. The important thing to do when drifting is just to keep in contact with the line. Whilst the drift is fairly slow at the moment, I still just have to keep up with it. So it looks as though I'm retrieving quite quickly, but of course the boat's heading towards my flies. So I need to do that. What I don't ever want is for the line to be below the tip of the rod like that and coming back towards the boat. If it's in that position, it means that I am not in contact with my flies. By having a slight away from the rod tip angle of the fly line, it means I'm moving those flies. I'm actually making them look like real insects. And was that, or is that weed? I think I've got a little bit of weed there. So quite a shallow area. I'll just pop this out again. Huh. How close can those fish be here? Yes. I saw that fish move, covered it across the wind. Oh, that's what I like to see. Don't know what he's taken yet. Uh, I spotted two fish move, actually. Because, as I say, the wind is to my back and I'm heading towards them, they're going up that way. I put the line out ahead of the fish by about six or seven feet to give a chance for the flies to get down a little bit. Oh, keep that while I get my net out. Not a big fish. Uh, he's taken the dial back. He's taken it on the top dropper. So he was fairly near the surface. <laughs> and his buddies are coming for a look. Right, he doesn't want to bring his head up. It's a lovely rainbow. He's trying to go under the boat. I can put a bit of side strain, turn him back round. He's gone under, so as long as I keep that angle, it doesn't matter about the rod being down, as long as the angle is there against the fish. I can see him right underneath me now. There, that's brought him back out. Now release some line, keep that angle. Head up out the water. Come on, that's it. Head up, we should have him now. And there we go. <sighs> I've got an eight fish ticket. That's one down, seven to go. There we go. Just to make sure. Beautiful Blagden rainbow. Now with this one, because I saw them feeding on the surface, I'm going to spoon it so I can see what they're actually feeding on. This is the spoon on the other end of my priest, a marrow spoon. I simply insert it, turn it 90 degrees, drag it out, 
and examine the contents. And here we see a corixa and buzzers. Very small, but still alive, that one. And those are the larvae of the non-biting midge. And that would have been a much bigger buzzer. So we're on the right sort of stuff. Well, we've already had one. I can see the odd fish moving directly in front of the boat here. It's just a question of how fast they're moving. Yeah, we're getting out over some activity now. They are fairly near, they're very near the top still. Yes, there we are. Top dropper again. There we go. He's in. We've got it. Another lively fish. And there's still fish moving around here as well. I must say, I was really expecting it to be very hard today. Two fish in just the first 20 minutes. It doesn't get any better than that. What a beauty. Right in the top with the dial back. There. And that one hasn't made too much of a mess. Should be able to get back out amongst them very quick. Well, whilst uh, it's been an excellent start, there are still fish moving here. I'm going to give it a little while longer. But it's only an eight-fish ticket, and I don't want to uh, catch all my fish too soon. I want a day out. You know, a day on a beautiful reservoir like this, you can't, you can't knock here. You really can't. This is, well, it's my idea of heaven. <laughs> Look at that. Fish move. The, the thing is, you know, you're at peace. It's just the birds singing, not much traffic noise. Oh, Who would ever want to go to work if you could do this every day? All right, now I must get myself comfortable and be ready. It's that thrill, you know, you, you cover the fish, you know it's in the area, is it going to take? And then the little tug on the line and the heart goes and... Oh, that's how I love it. I'm addicted. Totally addicted. All right, there's one over there, and we'll just pop that over in. Give it a few seconds to sink. More fish on the side there. And just because you cover them, there's no guarantee. Oh, but yes, there we are. When you see a fish moving, you can put the fly in front of it, anticipate where it's going to go, and reap the rewards. Oh. Ah, he's gone. Oh, let's have a look. That felt strange. I think what happened there, because the water's so shallow, the, it was on the top dropper, and the point fly or something has hooked the bottom. So the rod wasn't acting as a shock absorber anymore. It was able to run. The line locked solid, and he's actually snapped, and I've lost my two dropper, my dropper and my point fly on the bottom. I still got the top dropper that the fish was hooked on, but I'm gonna to have to reset up. It broke just below the knot. But you notice, there's the knot. The dropper was coming off of that. That's how I know that it got stuck on the bottom because the strength is still through there. What's happened, when it swam away like this, the line that was coming off there came back on itself like this and just snapped. Well, that hasn't been too bad at all. Join me in part two. Let's see how the rest of the day pans out.